like to welcome our second speaker then, who is uh, Osman Nemli from uh, uh, Vassar College, who is going to be presenting a paper entitled um, The Voice Before a Body, Sartre and Fanon on the Radio. And Osman, if you want to tell us a little bit about your broader project before you begin, that would be that'd be brilliant. Thank you. My, my broad concern is how to... Uh, I'm interested in returning to the conversation on the radio and Sartre and Fanon. I think that there has been a Manichaean division in the scholarship related to this. And so I want to treat the radio uh, broadly uh, and look at the radio today broadly as contributing to neocolonial mystifications. In the talk today, I just want to highlight the reasons why I think the radio is an interesting case study. I think ultimately for Sartre and Fanon, the radio reveals to um, go to a Deleuzean concept, perhaps the encounter between dialectical and anti-dialectical reason. And I think that if we move beyond a Manichaean opposition between Fanon seen as euphorically advocating for the use of the radio and Sartre just seeing it as a moment of serialization, we can instead see how in the encounter between anti-dialectical and dialectical reasoning, the radio furthers neocolonial mystification. So that's the um, the broad project. Um, but with that, I'll I'll, I'll start and, and see how far I get. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so scholarship has tended to approach Sartre and Fanon's respective views on the radio in a generally unreflective Manichaean manner. Not that their readings are unreflective, just how the two are positioned. They're usually seen as opposites, with Sartre having the stand, uh, according to the standard reading of the first volume of the Critique of Dialectical Reason, a negative view of the radio, similar to Adorno's view of the culture industry. While Fanon, based upon the revolutionary text, This is the Voice of Algeria, offers a more positive and revolutionarily politically progressive uh, account. Ian Baucom, for one, in his France Fanon's Radio, Solidarity, Diaspora, and the Tactics of Listening, uh, offers in an otherwise perspicuous reading the following. He says, quote, Fanon elaborates a theory of agency and collectivity quite different from that outlined in contemporaneous analyses of radio listening. In his examination of radio listening and collectives and the critique of dialectical reason, Sartre insisted that an audience of radio listeners had anything but a productive relationship to interpolative authority of the broadcast voice. Instead, Sartre argues such audiences are characterized by their passivity, end quote. Um, I take the sort of compartmentalized and rather undialectical view of this to be inadequate to the situatedness of both authors uh, and their positionality. Um, what I mean by unreflective here is that the particular situation of both texts of Sartre's and Fanon's is not addressed. While the general conditions that Sartre and Fanon are described are, one, the technology of the radio, two, the social and political circumstances and ontology of group formation, and three, colonialism and imperialism more generally, these three conditions uh, mean very little in an abstract way. Uh, and this bad abstraction would be unmediated. The ways in which these three conditions work are revealed via the mediated and mediating situation of, first, I would say the use of the radio on the part of colonial forces in colonial mainland France, on the one hand for Sartre, and the second, the use of the radio on the part of colonial forces and counter use of the radio by colonized peoples in the colony in Algeria, uh, on the other hand, by Fanon. So first, uh, addressing Fanon's account. Uh, following Simone de Beauvoir, we can say that one is not born, but rather becomes a body. Uh, a voice, according to Fanon and Sartre's analysis, facilitates this becoming. Um, so speak of the devil and he appears, kind of. Uh, there's nothing natural or necessary in the formation of a body, be it human or national. For Fanon, the radio is not neutral. After introducing the radio as a technical instrument and as providing a system of information, he highlights 1954 as a pivotal year uh, and turning point for the use of the radio in the Algerian War of Independence. Prior to then, it was a tool of domination and the tool of the colonial forces that disseminated information and that dehumanized the colonized Algerian population while following through with a form of linguistic colonialism. After 54, when it becomes part of the struggle, three elements come to the fore. Uh, first, the battle of and between truths. A second, how communication is a condition of possibility and impossibility for different forms of community. 
and three, a phenomenological interpretation of the broadcast voice and listener, almost a cyborg account of the voice. I wish to focus on this third element, the voice and the radio and th what this voice does. The immediate context for focusing on the third aspect is recent scholarship on Fanon that has returned to the debate from the 90s, namely whether Fanon's philosophical approach tends towards dialectics or anti-dialectics. Then Robert Bernasconi and Nigel Gibson, to name two, provided approaches of a dialectical Fanon. The anti-dialectical Fanon was advocated by, and continues today to be advocated by, Otto Sekiotu. More recently, the anti-dialectical reading has been provided by Gavin Arnold, while a dialectical Fanon is addressed by George Kikorio Mayer. My approach here is not to enter into that debate, but to show how one aspect of what readers of an anti-dialectical Fanon emphasize, the famed reference to Aristotelian logic. So usually to argue that uh, Fanon is an anti-dialectical thinker, um, scholars turn to uh, Aristotle's account of non-synthesizable and mutually exclusive pairs. Um, I want to address how the radio mediates another Aristotelian pairing, one that has a political resonance, and how what appears to be mutually exclusive in the register of logic is much more ambiguous and fluid in political circumstances. I'm, of course, discussing Aristotle's distinction between phone and logos, sound and speech, noise and reason from his politics. Aristotle admits there are many political animals, but of these animals, none except the human possesses logos. He, firmer, he further famously distinguishes the understanding of logos from its position when discussing the reference between citizens and slaves. Although he does not mention Aristotle explicitly, as he does in the Wretched of the Earth, um, in the radio piece, Fanon implicitly invokes an Aristotelian distinction used in a political context to separate citizen from slave. The radio broadcast prior to 1954 operates in a manner that compartmentalizes the colony, separating and segregating it in a Manichaean manner by contributing to linguistic violence. The radio voice is a voice of the occupier, according to Fanon. He writes, quote, every French expression referring to the Algerian had a humiliating content. Every French speech heard was an order, a threat, or an insult, end quote. He continues, paradoxical as it may appear, it is the Algerian revolution, it is the struggle of the Algerian people that is facilitating the spreading of the French language in the nation, end quote. So the imp imposition of the French language is not just from without or on part of the colonizer, it's facilitated by the colonized and the language is further disseminated by colonized peoples. However, the dialectic of such dissemination, as is shown with what occurs in English, uh, to English in the linguistic activities of non-native English speakers, means that the colonizing power has very little authority to dictate what becomes of this language or how it is used. So we might call this the boomerang effect of the voice. After 1954, something new develops with the use of the radio and voice in Algeria. Fanon again, quote, with the struggle for liberation, we see the initiation of a major process of exercising the French language, end quote. The voice of the occupier, quote, is stripped of its authority, end quote. This dialectic continues in a way that echoes Sartre's analysis of what happens to the French language in negritude poetry. I here want to highlight the transition from phone to logos, voice to speech. After stripping the authority of the voice of the occupier, Fanon writes in a manner that invokes Marx's theses and that also dialectizes Aristotle. Quote, the nation's speech, the nation's spoken words, shaped the world while at the same time renewing it. End quote. While the radio had in pre-1954 Algeria played the role of dehumanizing Algerians due to linguistic violence, a linguistic violence that reduced Algerian logos to phone and exalted the French alienated voice to nationalistic speech, we see in post-1954 the reversal of this, without however getting rid of the French language entirely. French and Arabic both become, with the revolutionary use of the radio, the Algerians' ways to bring the voice of the nation to the speech of the nation. What was, from the perspective of the occupier's voice, seen to be external to French cultural values, is now destroyed to make room for the speech of the Algerian nation. So to summarize before moving to Sartre, Fanon is sometimes read as being an anti-dialectical thinker due to his invocation of Aristotelian logic and black skin, white masks and the Manichaean separation. With the use of the radio, however, we see an otherwise non-dialectizable aspect of Aristotelian logic undermined and shown in a colonial context to be anything but static. While he does not explicitly refer to Aristotle, his interchange between voice, noise, and speech on the part of the colonizer and colonized show implicitly a dialectized Aristotle or a more dialectical uh, account of Aristotle's otherwise imperturbable logic. 
This will also prepare us to see Fanon emphasize the positive use of the radio only during a specific period of time. It is given, um, it is given what he writes in Wretched of the Earth, unclear whether this positive use of the radio will follow Algerians into the newly independent nation. The voice before a body Fanon indicates is initial and initially a French white voice contributing to an Algerian context to dehumanization, cultural erasure, linguistic violence, and anti-revolutionary propaganda. The aim is to create a disparate, pessimistic, and subservient colony. After 1954, with FLN tactics of resistance, counter and fugitive broadcasts informing the Algerian populace about revolutionary events, one sees a different voice and a different body being formed. But the horizon of this different voice and different body is much more tenuous and unclear in Fanon and not as euphoric. And I think there's a similar analogy to reading the euphoria similar to the first chapter of Wretched of the Earth without seeing the, the, the grandeur and the limit of the spontaneity. So a move into to Sartre. Sartre's most sustained theoretical reflection on the radio takes place in the first volume of the Critique of Dialectical Reason. In the appendix in the second, he returns to seriality, but most of what he says in the second volume, I think, is, is implicit, if not explicit, in the first. Uh, it's important to take note of this while following the work of Michael Scriven, Sartre's own radio broadcasts and interviews uh, discussing divergent social, political, and aesthetic issues. So on the one hand, we have a critical reflection on the use of the technical apparatus of the radio in the hands of a nationalist and a colonizing government for the purposes of s assembling a certain grouping of people, while on the other hand, we also have Sartre using the radio as an intellectual to assess singular political situations, domestic and international. The seeming performative contradiction on Sartre's part should at least cast into doubt the all too easy summary judgment that Sartre's anti-radio. I'll leave this performative contradiction aside for now and focus on the critique. In the critique, the radio makes its appearance in the chapter on collectives, which are taken to be akin almost and be the political correlative to Hume's epistemological bundles of experience a grouping of atomized individuals brought together in a structured manner wherein that structure is both externally imposed and the grouped elements cannot intermingle in a different or indeterminate manner with one another. So regardless of what you see on your morning commute to work with someone yelling at their radio, there is no communication. We can quickly summarize the negative pronouncements that Sartre provides. First, the radio broadcast is negatively evaluated whether he focuses on the speaker or on the listener, listening public. The broadcast is an indirect gathering, neither direct nor a site of collective praxis. It's a gathering in and of absence, since the only thing in common is the presence of a voice, an absent voice, an alienated and abstract voice. The effect on the listener at worst, uh, here's a favorite criticism of such impotence. It's reifying and it produces a sense of helplessness and inevitability. This is the God project inverted to the facticity of a stone. The voice, moreover, in its very presence absence is mystifying. Uh, though the listener is isolated in their reified ways, they can negate themselves and preserve only their presence as passive listeners. It's this aspect that allows them to join others in a non-reciprocal gathering invoked by the phrase, dear listeners, good night and good luck, and on. And finally, the impotence and the isolation of the listener is matched by a sense of inertia. The listener, short of turning off the radio in a burst of negative triumph, or applauding or shouting in agreement on, at the radio can do nothing, or rather, whatever the actions, it means nothing. I think Lewis Gordon has an interesting analysis of the radio in terms of just turning the dial from, uh, uh, I guess, radio broadcasts that are at one end of the spectrum and then at the other, but the middle broadcasts uh, white popular music. One can almost see Sartre's analysis of the radio applying to a pre-1954 Algeria as described by Fanon. So this is a moment of, I think, historic uh, hysteresis, a sort of bracketing of history. Sartre's analysis pushes back on the cultural resistance and social ontological regression at work in how a broadcasting voice contributes to crafting an overwhelmingly white French body, and one that ultimately is suffocating. I think the last two pages on the section on the radio, we get an indication of resistance to the radio's creation of inertia. A noted absence from Sartre's reflections are a focus on the use of the radio during the Second World War, during the Algerian War of Independence, or even during post-war Europe, such as Radio Free Europe. The analysis is simply ontological and phenomenological, and it seems to say nothing to the social and political matters that are happening in recent memory. 
It is with this nothing, I think, that Sartre presents the possibility of treating this otherwise indirect gathering or collective of alienated and isolated individuals as a practical inert for future practical activity. What I call the radio broadcast's voice before a body is an indication of what Sartre has as alterity, whether concrete and specific to particular broadcasts or pure and formal according to broadcasting capabilities more generally. His account initially remains at the level articulated by Fanon. The radio broadcast is both part of a technical system of communication and it serves the purpose of conveying information. However, in describing at least three possible dialectical responses to the radio and three implications of the serial assemblage involved by the voice alienated from the body, we can get an idea of how the very means of impotence, what was yesterday described, I would say, as, as failure, inevitable, necessary, uh, can in its formal ambiguity or inherent non-neutrality result in alternative possibilities. The voice before a body here gestures to the fundamentally ambiguous and non-neutral voice of a body not yet here. So we can think of pirated voices orchestrating new bodies. So moving further, what reveals itself in Sartre's analysis in a way that complements Fanon's account from Wretched of the Earth is that the radio is not just neutral, but tied to either national interests, nationalizing interests, or multinational corporatist ones. This makes it fundamentally problematic, yet nonetheless necessary that we respond to. We can examine this via two different scenes. One is the advertisement calling from individuals to own as a sign of affluence their own radio set, while the other asks individuals to gather around a radio in a cafe, tea house, or community center. The former serves to isolate, reducing the individual to passive listener and affluent owner. The other invites the possibility of a group infusion. And this alternative either or I think stage is precisely the dialectic and anti-dialectical encounter. Rather than seeing Sartre's analysis as simply a negative evaluation and critical description of the radio, we might approach this and other collective gatherings differently if we see them as invitations to contribute with a collective praxis to the isolating gatherings and the practical inert. Sartre begins his colonialism as a system by this diagnosing what he calls the neocolonialist mystification. He writes, neocolonialists think that there are some very good colonists and some very wicked ones, and that it's the fault of the latter that the situation of the colonies has deteriorated, end quote. Such mystifications, though not new, also don't seem to go away, even if and when colonialists have been removed and colonialism dismantled. How frequently indeed have current hegemonic institutions defended themselves and the morally repulsive and politically unjust actions of their members and representatives by claiming that the occurrence of any reprehensible behavior does not represent the values of this institution, or that there is no systemic issue here but individual cases. We can call this the fruit seller apology, that it is not the tree or the orchard that's the problem, but that we're only dealing with a case of bad apples. Such defenses have not gone away, nor have their contemporary diagnoses uh, diminished. What Sartre diagnosed as the neo-colonialist mystification comes back as an institution's obscene underside. Writing, um, writing further on, Sartre emphasizes uh, in a sarcastic and sardonic tone this neo-colonial mystification. Quote, but above all, let us not bring politics into this. Politics is abstract. What is the use of voting if you're dying of hunger? the sort of ethical um, uh, kidnapping and hi hijacking of the discussion. Those who come to talk to us about free elections, about a constituent assembly, about Algerian independence are agitators or troublemakers who only cloud the issue. Neocolonialism as a keyword is not frequently referenced in the secondary literature on Sartre and Fanon when it comes to the radio. Though not a subject frowned upon, it is with each advancing year featured less and less as a topic of discussion. This is a number of effects in how Sartre and Fanon are read, both individually as critics of the neocolonialist aspect uh, and how they are read in tandem with one another when it comes to the radio. And while I think Lewis Gordon's work really advocates for the use and emphasis of neocolonialism, it doesn't come back in the scholars that, that I've seen in the context of the radio. While Fanon is adamant that colonialism, at least in its Algerian context, will fail, that is the horizon, he is less and less optimistic when it comes to the dangers of neocolonialism and the possibility of the new nation avoiding the pull of Western capitalism on the one hand and Eastern socialism on the other. This initial silence, or at least reticence, to address neocolonialism as a topic of concern is troublesome for both of them. 
Such silences suggest either that Sartre and Fanon and others are wrong to raise this worry, um, and that the aftermaths of both liberation and the work of former colonial powers to maintain economic and political dominance is fraught. And another option is that neocolonialism as a topic of discussion, concept, or subdisciplinary concern is also avoided when we discuss the radio. So on the one hand, it seems that we're confirming the death of neocolonialism as, as concept when discussing the radio, which we already admit no longer matters. And I want to claim that in the larger project, the radio is alive more than ever through streaming processes. The attitude towards neocolonialism is not that different than the attitudes one finds in the scholarship towards the political importance and topical viability of the radio more generally. So I, I, I want to maybe bring this to a conclusion by uh, emphasizing a number of points. One is that I think we can respond to an anti-dialectical reading of Fanon by what I take to be an implicit dialectizing of Arist Aristotelian logic when it comes to voice and speech. Um, I think the radio is a case study that shows how a Manichaean strict opposition between forces can be undermined. I then see that uh, Sartre's account of the radio in France is a serializing one that facilitates colonization, but is not, as it were, blocked from an anti-colonial resistance domestically. Um, so I'll, I'll end it with that. Um, I don't know how much more time I have, but uh, thank you very much.